Hi, my name is Brian. Uh, I was here earlier this morning. This is a, less of a case study and more of a, a work in progress. This is a, a relatively recent undertaking, and so in that way it's a little more exciting, but I also don't have nice performance plots like ZZ had, so um, it's just I'm sort of thinking through how to solve this interesting algorithmic problem, um, and so that's what I've documented here a little bit. So, uh, so I've been working on this code called AMRX, which is one of four co-design centers in the Exascale Computing Project. So AMRX is actually developed here at Berkeley Lab. And it's a framework for developing block-structured AMR applications. Um, it's derived from uh, BoxLib, which was uh, the, the previous framework for doing things like this, and also has many elements of the Chombo framework, which is also developed here. Uh, it, AMRX is a framework and so science applications sit on top of it and those applications do many things. Most of them are fluid dynamics of some sort. There's reacting flows, so combustion, uh, chemi chemical combustion, nuclear combustion for astrophysics and terrestrial uh, applications. They do low Mach number flows, um, compressible and incompressible things. There's even a, an NBOT, there's a, there's a particle element of AMRX, so if you're doing particle grid or particle fluid interactions, you can do that. And then they're also working on some really interesting things with embedded boundaries and, and uh, complex geometries. So um, yeah, this is all, AMRX has many players in it, and this is, this is part of the DOE uh, Exascale Computing Project. Um, so one of the applications that I've been working on for the last several months, a few years in fact, is called Nix, which is a cosmology code. Um, Nix is actually a hybrid of uh, two sort of algorithms. There's a compressible flows algorithm, and there's also an n-body component. Um, so Nix does cosmological simulations that incorporate both baryonic matter, which is to say uh, fluid that has, uh, it's a fluid that collides with itself, it has viscosity and so on. And it also simulates dark, uh, collisionless dark matter. And so for that element they use particles. And then there's a nice particle mesh interface where particles can interact with an AMR mesh and vice versa. So it's used for simulating early universe things, for, for simulating the, for, the formation of uh, filaments in the universe, um, dark matter halos, AGN feedback stuff. There's, there's a lot of applications of this code. So I actually, this, it doesn't show up that well, I think, on the screen, but that's a, this is a, a simulation of filaments forming that I actually did on Cori not that long ago. Um, and it's part of a movie, and it looks really nice. Um, so there are a number of different sort of algorithms that are all operating at the same time in Nix. Uh, there's, you can roughly narrow it down to four. There are, as I mentioned, the compressible uh, flows component and then the, uh, the end body component. Those, relatively speaking, are, are fairly cheap to compute. Um, there's a, so the compressible flows algorithm, it requires some information from nearest neighbors of cells, and so it's sort of like a stencil. Um, the end body stuff is much more chaotic. It's, you're basically pointer chasing because the particles can kind of go anywhere and you have to figure out where they are on the grid. So that's much more sort of random access. It's a very memory latency bound um, algorithm. But the reason it's cheap is because the particle density is actually very low. So whereas in, um, in particle and cell codes for fusion, for example, the particle density, the number of particles per grid cell can be extremely high. Um, in cosmology, it is sort of the opposite. It can be of order 10 or even 1. So that's the reason it's cheap. It's not that the algorithm is cheap, it's that we have the particle density is, is, is quite low. Um, there's also a multigrid solver in Nix. That's done, we, uh, they do a Poisson, they solve a Poisson equation for gravity. Um, so that's our elliptic solver. Uh, that is relatively cheap, except at scale, um, which is fairly typical of, of uh, of multigrid solvers because they have, there's a lot of communication that's required uh, as you course in and uh, as you course in grids and then and then uh, and then as you do restriction and then prolongation back up to the fine grids. There's a lot of communication that goes on and that becomes very expensive at scale. So except for running at the largest scales, for example, on half or all of Cori, 
the multigrade component is relatively cheap. The really expensive part is actually radiation, which would not come as a surprise to anybody who's actually done radiation transport before. Um, that's, uh, but interestingly, there's actually no transport that's done in NICS. It's all point-wise calculations. That's basically microphysics. Um, so there's no stencils involved or anything like that, but it's still extremely expensive at all scales. It's basically independent of scale because it's a point-wise calculation. And so I'll show you why that is and then, and then why the, 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 the way I'm trying to fix it, um, for KNL especially. So in every cell, in a NICS calculation, we have to solve a heating cooling equation which decides it takes the, the ionization state of some number of atoms and it from that it computes how much radiation is deposited into the gas and conversely how much um, is, is cooled, how, how much, basically how the atoms interact with the radiation. And it's a, it's a first, you can write it as a first order differential equation that looks like this thing right here, which I've made quite simple. Um, th but this equation is a little bit strange because the, every time you evaluate the right hand side, this f of y and t, you actually have to solve an equilibrium constraint equation which depends itself on f. So every time you evaluate the right hand side, you have to do some kind of root find. This, this g of f is a, is a highly nonlinear function. Um, and so normally when you have, so it, it's worth saying that this, even though it's a first, there's only one equation, this is not a system of differential equations, it's just one, but it can be highly sensitive to the, the, uh, the dependent variable there so you can see large spikes in the solution um, as you evolve it in time. So you can sort of characterize it as stiff even though it's formally it's only one equation and you can't really call one differential equation stiff, but it has characteristics of, of stiff systems of differential equations. And normally when you have sort of misbehaving ODEs like this, uh, you need some kind of stiff ODE integrator. So something that's very simple like, uh, like Ranga Kutted will often give you the wrong answer on, with, with equations like this because it'll, they take the wrong time step and your solution will sort of spike all over the place and RK doesn't, RK4 doesn't capture that. Or it may not capture that unless you take extremely small time steps. So, uh, for this reason, um, because we ha generally have to evaluate the right-hand side many times and because every right-hand side evaluation requires doing a root find, this is in fact the most expensive component in all of NICS is solving this ODE. And it has to be done in every cell. Um, so to refresh people's memory, um, we, just do, uh, we just do a Newton method for solving this. Um, it's nonlinear, so this is sort of the natural way to go. Um, the problem, there are a number of problems with doing lots and lots of Newton methods on KNL. Uh, they include, for example, uh, the lack of vectorization between iterations. So within a cell you can't really vectorize much of anything because there's a data dependence. So as you solve for this parameter, as you try to converge this lambda towards zero, uh, the solution of lambda at n plus 1 depends on the solution of, la of lambda at n. So that data dependence makes vectorizing along the iteration axis not possible. And so uh, effectively, not effectively, in reality, all of, this, all of these ODE integrations in every cell are done in scalar. And so you're throwing away a huge amount of performance that's available on KNL, in particular all those wide SIMD units. So we can't really vectorize within a cell how are we doing on time? I don't have my, I don't have my watch with me. 23, 23. okay. Um, so we can't really vectorize within a cell and so the solution that we're, that we're implementing right now is actually vectorizing across cells. So in effect, we're trying to, so we're trying to integrate um, eight of these ODEs simultaneously, um, which is, is an interesting challenge that, that I've never encountered before, but it's a lot of fun. Um, so, SIMD so unlike threads, uh, SIMD lanes operate in lockstep. So if you have a threaded region, your threads can diverge in their workload and do different things. That's not a problem. Um, SIMD lanes can't do that. They have to do the same thing in every lane. And so if your algorithm has any kind of variability due to a convergence criterion or something like that, that makes doing SIMD a little bit challenging. Um, and, that, and variability is certainly a component of what we're trying to do here. There's actually two chief sources of variability among, for example, eight ODEs from eight neighboring cells. The first one is that 
the number of iterations to do the, the number of Newton iterations that you have to do to, to satisfy that equilibrium constraint um, is unique to the initial conditions and to the right hand side of every cell. So the number of root, the number of iterations to do your root find might be different in, in neighboring cells. The other source of variability is that we use a stiff integrator to, to, to integrate this differential equation and it's actually an adaptive method and so the number of steps that it will take to, to integrate from time t0 to t1 may be different for two neighboring cells. So again, there's, it's, it's challenging to, 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 uh, to handle that kind of variability in SIMD. But we have some methods for doing that, I think. Uh, one of those consists of vectorizing the right-hand side so that f of y and t, um, in Nix, that's actually a little bit complicated because every right-hand side evaluation requires a Newton solve. Um, so what we do to vectorize the Newton solve is, is sort of, we, we do a few extra sort of pointless flops in order to do everything in SIMD. That's a fairly common pattern in, in writing vectorizable code. Uh, in particular, what we do is we just keep iterating until the slowest converging cell has converged. So you might have one cell that only takes two Newton iterations to get to zero, and the cell right next to it takes nine, while the cell that got there first is just going to keep bisecting, it's, or not bisecting, but it's going to keep trying to do that root find and get even closer to zero. So the hope is that it won't actually diverge, which theoretically is possible to do. Um, in our tests, it actually, these are fairly well-behaved root finds, so they don't do that. Um, so that's how we deal with that kind of, with, with, that's how we vectorize the right-hand side, is we actually vectorize eight uh, uh, simultaneous Newton solves. Um, the other, as for the other source of variability, we're vectorizing the, the we're trying to vectorize the, the stepping routine itself, uh, and it's a similar spirit. So a well, a well behaved ODE might only take three steps to get from time T0 to T1 in that integration, and another one might take 10. And so what we do is we just pick the, what we're trying right now is we just pick the slowest uh, whatever the smallest time step that it needs to take in order to satisfy the, the convergence criteria, we just do that. So even for a well-behaved ODE, we make it take really small time steps just like all the others. And that's just to keep, that, that's so everybody can operate in lockstep. Um, that may not be the, that's not our final answer. That's sort of one thing that we're trying. I think there are better things coming in the pipeline, but that's sort of a first order approach to, uh, to solving this problem. But again, we're doing a, a lot of extra floating point operations that we, in theory, we don't need to do, but the net benefit is still worth doing because you've done a few extra that you don't need, but you've also are doing eight at a time. So the speed up overall from doing this will certainly not be a perfect factor of eight, but it'll be larger than one as opposed to doing it all in scalar, which is how it's done right now. Uh, that's unreadable, so I will skip that. Uh, I think this is also pretty unreadable. So this is just the last bit of the Newton uh, of the Newton method that's done in, in SIMD now. So you can see here's the Newton, here's the right-hand side of a Newton iteration where you take the function divided by its derivative, and then all we do, there's actually a bug in this. This last loop doesn't need to be there. It's just need to do that evaluation once. But I just check that the convergence criteria, I, what I, I check for the largest error um, for all eight lanes, for all eight SIMD lanes, and if all of them are less than the required convergence, then we're done. And if not, then we keep going. Um, so that this kind of thing looks a little weird in code, but but it, it works very well um, on KNL, at least in preliminary tests. Um, okay, so uh, one final point: there's if you're using an, an explicit integrator that's still adaptive, like RKF four five. Uh, this one's RKF45 is actually pretty straightforward to vectorize. That's a, it's a it's an integrate it's an integration scheme. It's probably the simplest adaptive integration method. Um, that's because explicit methods they just evaluate the right hand side and that's how they that's how they decide when they're converged. If you do something implicit like VOD, uh, which uses BDF, implicit methods are much more complicated because generally they're solving some kind of linear system at every integration step because implicit methods lead to a Jacobian matrix that you then have to um, solve for. And so solving eight systems of linear equations in SIMD is, is not so straightforward. So that's something that we're still thinking about right now. 
Um, but this is all work that we're doing with a number of other people in ECP, so it's, we're certainly not, this is not a hero effort. We're, there's a lot of people involved in, in doing this. Um, I think that I'm probably out of time. How am I doing, Rebecca? Is that it? Cool. Can I ask another question? Sure, go ahead. So, in kind of analogy to this parallel in time stuff that people have been working on, I wonder if you could consider parallelizing a, a scalar iteration solve by simply scattering a bunch of points. Uh, because you're, you're, after all, your, your derivatives are not quite right, and other things that you're doing in computing, the next iteration is not quite right. What if you just have six or eight different tries uh, for each iteration and pick the best one and let that be the starting point for the next iteration? Uh, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, I, hadn't, I hadn't tried that yet, but I, I see no reason why that wouldn't work. So. Maybe that'll be step two. So thank, thank you for the comment. You're welcome. Thank you for an interesting talk. <laughs> anything else? Anything on chat? I don't see anything. <laughs>